the Niobe Seclusion. A mansion of immense size surrounded by acres of neatly kept garden. It's tranquil here. In fact, it appears utterly devoid of life. That's odd. Oh my god, they have seven cask casks of Navaratine gemstones as a deal. Probably gonna buy those. Yeah, they normally sell for 300, so it's not like a huge bargain, 250 versus 300, but it's something. The prison and the cottage. Polyhedric sculptures, the dimensions eye-wateringly off. Grass of uniform color and uniform length. Placid canals crisscrossed at right angles, all bisected by a pale gravel path leading to the door of a broad, ivy-shrouded mansion. Only its lack of windows betrays Piranesi as a prison. Oh, this whole place is a prison? Utter silence bar the crunching of gravel beneath your feet. As you approach, you take note of a tiny cottage, incongruously, uh, incongruously nestled beside the mansion like a louse. A curtain twitches. Hmm. Do I want to jump straight into the feline eccentric stuff? I don't think I want to do any of the quest stuff yet. Let's learn more about what this place is all about first. Enter the cottage. The prison is locked, but the cottage door swings open at your approach. The only sound in the cottage is that of a teaspoon clinking against porcelain. A group of brown robed figures turn to regard you. One, gray haired, gray eyed, offers you tea. We are the chaplains, she says. Our role is to help inmates reach egress. You must understand, none may leave Peronesi unaltered. We can be your guide, pipes another. Two tours per visit. Choose your chaperone and take care to follow the rules. Ooh, Peronesi is a treacherous port and not amenable to low-level visitors. Be wary. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm, I'm max level, so I should be fine. Just don't give me nightmares. Oh, there's a lot of people to have as my guide. Well, let's ask why first. Why do you need a guide? The windowless prison is, a lar is large, but surely it could be mapped. The great-eyed woman sips her tea. Do not attempt to judge size or distance here. Paranesi is unmapped and unmappable. There are only a few areas we know how to reach. I'll show you the statue garden, says the bearded chaplain with kind eyes, where I help prisoners achieve redemption. I know the Warrens. Beneath the shadows of the third chaplain's hood, you glimpse a slithering mass of disturbed flesh. He says nothing more. The final chaplain wears round spectacles, but his eyes are gone. His grin threatens to break free of his face. Come with me, come with me. Oh, please, I'm so very bored. Hmm. Does that mean each person that can guide me can only guide me to certain things? Because they each have their own specialty? The garden? The warrens? Or... This one doesn't say what they can do. Is there just three? No, there's four different ones. Hmm. Well, given that I can only... Given that it's dangerous in there and I can only enter a couple times, maybe I don't want to just do everything and then try to do the main quest stuff. Yeah. Let's accompany the feline eccentric to the gardens. She said that here you would learn about her malevolent cats and why she can't be rid of them. I entered Peronesi as something else, something vast and inhuman, something tired. In my nightmares, I remember a cold court, countless statues. I remember the dead prostrate before me as I pronounced sentence, she shudders. I wasn't kind. Hold on, before I even read more. Like, I'm pretty sure they're talking about the, the well, the white well, in the Blue Kingdom. Right? Like, I... 
Everything they just said fits. A cold court. Well, yes, it's very icy and cold there. Statues. I think I remember lots of statues being noted there. Um, the dead before them. Pronouncing them uh, a sentence. You know, the judge. They used to be a judge. Damn. They've changed a lot, huh? They weren't joking when they said people leave Paranesi changed. Paranesi changes you, but it's merciless. I cut off those parts of myself that were false and laid them on the protean altars. I outwitted the face monger and chose a countenance of my own. I hauled my better self through the labyrinth of names. I defied the judgment of the moon's locks, and they opened. I emerged, new, raw, happy. The person, more or less, that I'd chosen to be. But the cats came too. She scowls at one, which is clawing at a sapling. I have my suspicions about them. She stops. A stern, gray-haired woman is watching you both from beside one of the sculptures. We don't get many return visitors, the woman remarks. Tea? She leads you to the little cottage. Join the Grey Conformer for tea. That's a weird name. Grey Conformer. The Conformer is stern and brusque, but fascinated by the eccentric in her cats. She brews you strong, dark tea and peppers your officer with questions. Ask about getting rid of the eccentric's cats. Is it really impossible, as the eccentric claims? Oh, yes. You can't cast them aside any more than you could cast aside your shadow. They're vestiges of what, of that version of you that entered Paranesi long ago. Vestiges you chose not to keep. For some reason, they followed you out. Perhaps the old you was not cast deep enough into Paranesi. It was notably stubborn. You see, the eccentric says to you, I'm stuck with them. Of course, the conformer says, slurping her tea loudly. They could choose to leave you. Wait, what? The eccentric's head whips around to face her. Why didn't you bloody say so? How do we convince the cats to leave? The conformer said that the cats could choose to leave the eccentric. Perhaps it can be encouraged to do so. This is an unusual case, the conformer says defensively. But these vestiges are, in essence, aspects of the being who entered Paranesi and emerged as you. They have opinions and preferences, as do we all. If you find somewhere they like, they may stay there. Or if you do something they hate, they may leave. Carrot or stick. The eccentric frowns at the cats. How do we know what they like and hate? The conformer shrugs. No one knows them better than you. The tea is finished. You return to your engine. I need to think, says the eccentric. Hmm. Well, I can guess that they would want to go back where they came from and where they spent their time, probably at the White Well, right? At the court? Oh, there's a separate thing for each of the three cats. Hmm. What is this going to take? Three savage secrets? Um, oh, right. You can only do stuff if your engine is in good shape, basically, because otherwise they would be too busy repairing it and keeping it going. Well, these all seem totally reasonable. Like, they don't really take that much. Tales of Terror, Sky Stories, Unlicensed Charts, sure. Consider secrets you've learned and how to rid her of Asmody. Asmody? Asmody. Asmodi is a saggy ginger cat, his face scarred from countless fights. When you approach him, he hisses at you, his ears flat back. Asmodi the Thunderer. The eccentric shows you her ankle, livid with a lattice of claw marks. Asmodi is a ball of anger. As if on cue, there's a hiss from under the galley table, and Asmodi attacks your knee. You fend him off. He climbs onto a shelf, his fur bristling. There's somewhere he might feel at home, the eccentric says reluctantly. But it's not anywhere I want to go. The white well in the blue kingdom. The things that were cast into its rage against their fate. Alternatively, you could drive him away by 
damping his fury. The attendants at Magdalene's, it is said, can soothe the wildest soul. Hmm. Blue Kingdom or Magdalene's? Magdalene's sounds more pleasant. Muse on tales of the sky and discuss how to rid her of Pyman. Pyman, an aloof, flat-faced gray, gives you a baleful look. He's climbed into a cranny under the ceiling and won't let anyone near. Hmm, um, I think Pyman must be the one in the portrait. Because the other one was ginger, this one down here is black. Aloof, flat-faced gray. Yeah, that's Pyman over there. Pyman the Denier. Pyman is very governed, the eccentric observes. The gray cat watches you stiffly out of reach. He never plays, and he doesn't like it when I... Well, watch this. She comes and sits next to you. Immediately, Pyman jumps up, pries you apart, and sits primly between you. He is aloof and restrained. Perhaps you enjoy, enjoy Carillon, where penitents submit themselves to stern punishments and endure them without complaint. Or, to drive him away, I've heard that at Ackley's one can buy substances that make fools even of kings and bishops. Would it be mean to drive them away rather than giving them somewhere they would like to be? It feels mean, doesn't it? Hmm. Aklis is in this zone. But Kirillin is back in the reach, obviously, and I kind of need to go there anywhere to clear my soul to go to Caduceus. And I want to go to Magdalene's maybe to drive away the other one, but if that's mean, then I should go to the White Well instead. Uh, let's see where the third one wants to go. Scour your charts and discuss how to rid her of Beleth, or Baleth. Nah, Beleth. Beleth is a gaunt black cat, always pushing himself to the front at feeding time, always sitting where people need to be. Beleth the Demander. Beleth barges past you in the corridor. He has heard two stokers arguing. When he finds them, he watches, rapt, with the air of an ancient philosopher king. <laughs> He's fascinated by their red faces, their bristling mustaches, their pointing fingers and clenched fists. The eccentric joins you. Beleth admires force, she whispers. He would fit in at the floating parliament, where MPs push their beliefs into law using words as swords and procedures as nooses. Yes, the eccentric muses. I think he'd like that. And I know what he'd find intolerable. Dreams. Those dreams where the rules all change and your strength is useless. The roses of Caduceus could help. Hmm. Okay, so there's there's no like one place I can go that's gonna deal with all these cats, really. I'll just deal with it as it comes. So as far as giving them good places to go, there's floating parliament, there's the white well, and... Carillon. Yeah. So, basically one in every region other than this one. Okay, fair enough. Consider the eccentric situation. What does this do? Is this just like a summary of what I learned? Sort of? Um, it's just telling me what I... It doesn't give me the specific locations, but just reminding me that I need to get rid of the cats. Yeah, I guess that's all it is. Just a reminder, in case you've forgotten. Okay. That's all of that for now. Now, the princess. Locate the silly old thing for the princess. The incognito princess left a silly old thing in the most secure prison in the skies. She wants it back. Wait, why did you leave something here? Hmm. Were you imprisoned here? Hmm. Yeah, all right. The Ugly Duckling. 
When I was a lesser person than I am now, explains the princess as you approach the prison, I had awful habits. I went through a phase that was best described as monstrous. Too much wild red honey, I'm afraid. Perhaps it was all for the best, she says. If I hadn't gone through that awkward stage, I wouldn't have ended up where I am today. However, before I can safely move on, I need to tidy up. As such, it really can't be alive anymore. I just won't stand it. So, we have the candle and a tail. We can begin, she says. It can't be alive anymore, I just won't stand it. What can't be alive anymore? Right, I'm scared. <laughs> Where's this going? She pulls out the candle, places it on the floor, and lights it. She gestures at you, and you start reciting the tale of terror. From the flame's tip grows a large, tear-shaped door of red and orange. The princess claps her hands in glee. Hold this. I don't want to risk ruining it. I fear fisticuffs will follow. She says, passing you her tiara. Wait for my return. It'll only be a few minutes. She skips through the doorway. You stand there with only a tiny flame, an incongruous door, and a rambling, terrifying narrative for company. Soon you're joined by the most dangerous of companions. An idea. Oh, trap the princess. Success will end your journey with the incognito princess. She will not be pleased. The princess needs you to keep telling this story to escape. Stop telling the story, the troublesome princess, troublesome no more. Hold on, what is going on here? A lit candle, reciting a tale of terror. From the flame's tip grows a large, tear-shaped door of red and orange. They're going into... What is... This seems familiar. Lighting a candle. Lighting a candle sounds really familiar to the things that attract the face eaters or something. <sighs> Hold on. I'm going to do a little bit of Googling into fallen London lore. All right. It's time for a rambly explanation as I attempt to explain things that I half understand. But I have a hunch about what the princess is. Sort of. Let me explain. So, Fallen London is, I think, like the name of the universe that this game takes place in. There's a web game that I think is just called Fallen London, and then there are Sunless Seas, which was set in the Fallen London universe. Sunless Skies, also set in the Fallen London universe. So, that means if you want to know about certain things, then the information about that thing doesn't only come from this game, but from other games and from the web game and where else they're might be information that's uh you know official lore of the fallen london universe i think what this doorway is and where they're going is to parabola i think i think we've heard parabola mentioned once before in this game remember when we had a magician make a small cat look like a lion I think that was for the fortunate navigator and we did that back at the circus like part of um what they wanted their friend to see their friend had never seen a lion we thought it'd be a good adventure so i just got a normal cat and the magician made it look like that cat was actually a big cat i think that's been the only mention of parabola in this game but as people have described to me a bit about what happened with it our interactions with it in sunless sea um from that and also also looking at the wiki right now, uh, the Fallen London wiki, that is, just to describe Parabola. Beneath the skin of dreams, behind the faces of mirrors, an orange sun sails in a fervid sky. Here are the borderlands of that place, close by Urim, and closest still to the house of the amber sky. And here you are in another place. The sun is warm on your uncovered head. So it talks about being behind a mirror, talks about an orange sun and a fervid sky. 
That's what made me think that when it mentions... Where is it? From the flame's tip grows a large, tear-shaped door of red and orange. So the door is red and orange. And it describes Parabola on the wiki as having an orange sun and fervid sky. Uh, Parabola is a dreamlike realm populated by strange creatures and featuring impossible geography. And then... Um, Parabola is more than a dream, however, as those who enter it disappear from the physical world for the duration of their stay and can reappear in other locations. Uh, da, da. Oh, here we go. Here's here's some of the big stuff that made me think this is relevant for the princess, aside from the, uh, the whole red and orange thing. Um, oh yeah, I totally abandoned my idea of this being, um, a thing related to, uh... Christ, I forgot what they were called, but there are creatures that will take people's faces and pretend to be them and they're attracted to candles, but this is not that. Because the candle's not attracting anybody, it's just being used to open a doorway. Anyway, the dreams of those living in the Neath have some influence over the geography of Parabola. Memories of light, frequent nightmares, and prisoner's honey are the primary means by which a person is transported to Parabola. However, it is not unheard of for people to pass into it directly by stepping through a mirror. So especially the prisoner's honey thing, I'm not exactly sure what the relationship between prisoner's honey and red honey is, but I think it's very similar. And the princess just told us that they were a worse person in an older time. They were, I think, like ad addicted to prisoner's honey or something like that. So they've taken it, and that probably is what put them in Parabola. And then it goes on to say, in fact, mere possession or mere madness is a somewhat common malady in London and throughout the Neath. Possessed individuals can pass for normal people, but must always carry a mirror on their person. Refusal to relinquish a mirror when asked is grounds for suspicion of potential mere possession, and this suspicion is confirmed if one is inhumanly strong. I don't remember if we've seen them be super strong. I know we've seen them do some real weird stuff a little while ago. Actually, quite a while ago. I just don't remember exactly what happened, to be honest. I might go check that, but... The whole thing about possessed individuals can pass for normal people, but must always carry a mirror on their person. That makes me suspect that, uh, remember the princess said, like, I can't go inside, they'll make me change, and I like, can't do that, or something like that? That's what made me think they have a mirror. And they don't want to be stripped of the mirror because they need it. Again, this isn't like 90... I'm not like 99% sure that this fits, but I'm 95% sure. There's a lot of things that are fitting. Now, I think I'm going to go see if I can find the information about what happened with the Incognito Princess a while ago. That whole thing where they were... Like, a place burned down and it sounded like they were had the power of the sun, almost. I couldn't find the episode. I went through the playlist, and I mean, at this point, I have over a hundred episodes, <laughs> and none were titled with, uh, this is the episode where the princess thing happens, and, well, I tried to find it a couple other ways, too, and couldn't. I don't want to search manually through, like, a hundred different episodes, so I don't know exactly what happened there. I don't remember, but I think we're going to trap the princess. I mean, we've joined the liberation of night. We hate Queen Victoria and London. Trapping the princess seems like the right thing to do. It's dawning on Elizabeth more and more and more. It's, I mean, it's been dawning on Elizabeth for a long time that there's something very wrong with the princess. And we've been scared of them for quite a while. And now with this, I think it's dawning on Elizabeth that they are some sort of creature pretending to be a person. And they're from Parabola, I think. At least that's, that's what we think at the moment. I guess we're probably not going to get to play out the whole quest line, but I don't want to trap the princess. The princess needs you to keep telling the story to escape. Stop telling the story. The troublesome princess troubles him no more. 
There's a 98% chance of success, so it's not guaranteed. Oh, thank God. You take a deep breath and stop the story. Or rather, you try. Your tongue serves another and will not rebel. You know the princess will be returning shortly. Will she be aware of your betrayal? It's impossible to tell. What are you missing? This is Saint Solanasi's candle. Saint Solanasi, a story cast into a well. This story will not end. Perhaps you need a well? You look, and then a possibility presents itself. Your mouth. A well where stories come from, where stories are hid. So, perhaps you have to eat the candle? <laughs> Abandon the plan, or eat the candle you're committed now. <laughs> Actually, you know what I should do is look up St. Solanase and see if I can find that on the wiki. Alright, I didn't find anything called St. Solanas's candle, but I did find some other stuff related to it, I think. <clears throat> this is going to be kind of winding and confusing because I don't even entirely understand it myself. I'm piecing this together from wiki pages that don't really tie all this information together in an easily understandable way. But they've mentioned the well multiple times in St. Solanasi's candle. I searched for that sort of stuff and I found that in... Uh, I think this was... I'm not sure if this was in Fallen London or in Sunless Seas. Um, but anyway, it's on the Fallen London wiki. Mm, there is a place called The Well. Here's a description. The summit of Winking Isle is two dozen paces across. In the very center stands a well of black brick. As you cross the grass, scents arise. Crushed flowers, camphor, ice. There may or may not be a lighthouse. And looking at like the different actions that you can do there, there are two different candles that you can use there. Saint Urzalia's candle and Saint Forthigan's candle. So those obviously seem very similar to Saint Solanasi's candle. And just looking at what happens if you succeed using Saint Urzuli's candle. But then, if you succeed with it, it says, The seven treacheries guard the neath, but there is one place more closely guarded still. A place the masters can't touch. A place the bazaar can't see. A place beneath St. Cerise's well. The place where hearts go. The Nadir. That's N-A-D-I-R, Nadir. God, should I look up Nadir and go further down the the well, as it were? <laughs> I don't know. This is related to a quest line called Seeking Mr. Eaton's Name. I, I'm not exactly sure what all this is about, but it's bad, and I'm pretty sure that I should do whatever I can to stop the princess. Hmm. I looked up the Nadir. There's a lot to absorb about it, but I, I don't think there's anything there that's really going to inform my choices. I'm going to eat the candle. This is either going to be great or really bad and embarrassing. I'm just imagining the princess coming back. The very, very powerful princess coming back, looking at me and finding me just with my cheeks stuffed like a chipmunk with candle. Eat the candle. You're committed now. You see the hazy shape of the princess through the door. There's no time to waste. You take the candle and push it into your still, story-spouting mouth. The beeswax crunches between your teeth, the flame still burning as you gag down every part of the candle. Afterwards, you feel it burn brightly inside you. But for the flame and pain, one thing does end. The story. You stop telling the story as soon as you swallow the candle. You hear the princess make an oddly strained cry of surprise, tinged with despair. The door is gone. The princess is trapped. It's only then that you realize something hard and sharp is still in your hand. The princess's tiara. Her finest. Yours now. This feels 
kind of bad. I, like, I'm pretty sure I did the right thing, but it feels kind of bad because now that they're trapped, I can't talk to them, right? I don't think I'm going to get any further answers about what this all was about. I think that's it. Oh, Jesus. You trapped the incognito princess in Paranesi. They've left my locomotive. Thousand experience. Useless. Lost one hearts, one veils, one iron, one mirrors. Ow. And I've gained a captivating treasure. I think I did the right thing. I just wish I was more sure of that. I wish somebody would come and talk to me and be like, Hey, I noticed what you did. Let me explain or something. <laughs> mm. That's it. That's it. They're just gone. You hear the emptiness of that wind? That's how I feel. Okay, let's get a, a guide. Let's choose the glib performer as my guide. Eyes like coal pits, incongruous above a broad and delighted smile. The glib performer hoots with laughter. He grabs an iron lamp from a high shelf and hurries you from the cottage. We shall be the very best of friends, you and I. He prods and shoves you up the gravel path to the doorstep of Paranesi. Footprints are worn into the stone. He has no key. He simply stands back, whistles sharply, and the grand oak door opens without further protest. There is nothing and no one on the other side. You follow the performer as he dashes into the dark. Paranesi is, of course, bigger on the inside. The performer's lamplight stretches only so far. You catch sight of dizzying spiral stairways, columns clad in chains, walls grooved by trickling water. The performer scampers ahead, chattering idly about the streets and architecture of London. After a few minutes, you are halted by some toppled scaffolding. Paranesi has three rules, says the chaplain, helping you climb over the obstacle. The penalty for breaking them is incarceration, and the unwritten fourth rule is that chaplains are forbidden from explaining them to visitors, so I'm afraid you must discover them yourself. Tread carefully in the meantime. Great. Great. Great, that, that, yeah, sure. Continue following the performer. Follow close, my dear, or something will happen to you. <clears throat> Further into the prison, you begin to see inmates, faint lights, shuffling across distant bridges, hunched figures with lamps chained to their wrists. See those lamps? asks the performer, elbowing you in the ribs. They impose a distortion of distance. A prisoner's proximity to the exit is determined by how they've changed since they entered. The more they change, the closer they are to freedom. Some are more mutable than others and severity of sentence varies. The performer throws a pebble into a cavernous well. After some time, a faint ouch echoes from below. Those cast into the deepest reaches must change beyond all recognition. Come, the performer leads you up a staircase, so steep it rapidly becomes a ladder. Down below, the others stop me having my fun. At the top, you find yourself among bridges and precarious ledges. The vapor swirls below your feet. The performer dances across dizzying drops, and when you come upon a cluster of prisoners, he begins tripping and prodding them with glee. <laughs> One is knocked from her perch and only saved when she clings to a gargoyle. Join in, he says. It's a terrible good time. What a weirdo. Let's get a port report. Unless that's breaking one of the rules. See what scraps of information you can glean from the performer's witterings. 
The performer sits on the edge of a balcony, legs kicking above a stomach-churning drop, and launches into a dozen unlikely stories of Paranesi. Prisoners turned to moaning jelly, angels made of clustered hands, a son in chains. He ends most of his tales unceremoniously, without coherent conclusion or explanation, skipping immediately to another. Fact is impossible to untangle from fiction. When you take out your pen and make notes of his ramblings, the performer claps his hands in amused delight. His grin somehow broadens. I'd forgotten this. It reminds me of old times. What will you tell them of me, I wonder? Help him torment the prisoners? <laughs> hmm. You unlock this by not having any the third rule of Paranesi. Uh, I'm guessing this would break the third rule? That... Wait. Refusing to mistreat the prisoners would also break the rule? Oh hey, recruit some wandering prisoners to join the psalmists at the White Well. Yeah, they need backup there. If you help them escape, they'll join whatever obscure sect you like. Yes. You sit down and talk to a group of prisoners about change, uh, specifically conversion. You talk about the Judas Psalm and the power of cursing and the joy of spite. You talk until your voice is a hoarse whisper. The performer sits precariously on a balcony's edge, punctuating your sentences with the occasional manic laughter. It takes a long time, but some of the prisoners come round to the psalmist's creed. A few lanterns fall from a few wrists. The redeemed in spite dash for the exit, promising to board your train outside. Refuse to mistreat the prisoners. You're not a brute, not without a reason. I understand, says the performer. Not everyone enjoys my little games. We should ascend. He bows low and sweeps his arm. After you. As you walk past him, you feel a cold drought of air at your back. When you turn, he's gone. You're stranded deep within a prison the size of a continent, and you're alone. Thanks. You wander up and down an endless crisscrossing network of staircases and walkways and bridges and buttresses and spiraling paths. It's freezing and silent and dark as dusk. The only light is the soft glow of prisoners' lamps in the distance, spotting the darkness like stars. The performer will come and find you soon, surely. Well, it's a good thing I'm kind of built for this. I got mirrors and veils up the ass. What a weird sentence. Mirrors and veils up the ass. Yeah. Alright. Attempt to find the performer. He must still be nearby. 100% chance of success. Gotcha, you prick. You find him on a high perch nearby, grinning teeth gleaming from the shadows. When you spot him, he swings down to your side again, letting loose a high peal of laughter. Follow, follow, he exclaims. It continues your tour as though nothing has happened. You follow the performer up corkscrew stairs and across walkways as wide as your hand. The floor is sickeningly far below. Finally, he stops at the threshold of a grand stone bridge beneath a cracked arch. He turns to you, lifting his spectacles and scratching at the withered interior of an eye socket. Ugh. It's too dangerous for us to go further unless you've learned the first and second rules of Paranesi, he says. Well, I haven't. Then we should return to the gate, says the performer, grinning. Come back when you're a veteran of this place. Wait, so is the only way to learn the rules is to break them and become imprisoned? The performer leads you down, down, down to Paranesi's main door, and then out into the light and air where the sky seems dizzyingly wide. He bows mockingly, turns on his heel, and skips back to the chaplain's cottage. Um, the chaplains will only allow two tours at a time before they temporarily close the prison to visitors. Okay. Well, let's do one more then. Gallant Reformer. 
Yeah, all right. A chaplain with an amiable smile and gray streaked hair. He reminds you that this is your last tour of the day. The gallant reformer nods, putting aside his tea and fetching an old iron lamp from a high shelf. Once more unto the breach, he says with a tired smile. You follow him out of the cottage, up the gravel path to the doorstep of Paranesi. Footprints are worn into the stone. He has no key. He simply knocks on the grand oak door and it opens. There is nothing and no one on the other side. You follow the reformer into the dark. You stroll the reformer through a forest of jutting stone limbs and impassive heads. A haunting refrain echoes. Somewhere, someone is playing the flute. Miscellaneous items scatter the floor. A sledgehammer, a toy soldier, a spinning wheel, a half-eaten jar of honey, a canvas. Perhaps discarded by previous prisoners, perhaps provided to provoke or inspire change among those still entombed. Change needn't be bad, says the reformer. I try to help the prisoners improve themselves. Let's follow the sound of the flute. You come upon a woman, or something shaped similarly to a woman, in a long brown coat and hat. The venerable flautist? Flutist flautist? She sits atop a stone idol where four paths cross, her legs crossed beneath her long brown coat. Her hat is pulled low, covering her eyes. The reformer introduces you. This is the venerable flutist, the oldest prisoner of Paranesi. She's been here for centuries. And how has she changed in that time? She pauses her tune. Well, she says cheerfully, so far I've managed to learn the flute. <laughs> okay. Huh. Oh, I can ask them about the rules of Paranesi. Yes, what do I need? I need their friendship. Well, let's do that then. Tell her a story. She's eager for tall tales from the outside world. A lovely tale. She plays you a tune quite incongruous with the bleak architecture of Paranesi. It rings of honey and sunshine and fills you with brandy warmth. Let's ask him about the rules. Oh, it uses hearts. 28% chance. She's been here longer than anyone. She must have worked out the rules by now. Instead of replying, she plays a short, unhappy tune. <sighs> well, let's return to the reformer. He's hanging back, watching. He seems unwilling to speak to the flutist himself. Shall we begin? Wait, what is this? Press the reformer for information on the other chaplains. I need rapport with the reformer. Eight. Okay. Shall we begin? The reformer rings a bronze bell. Prisoners gather like fireflies. The reformer moves between prisoners, fixing them one by one with an inescapable stare. For each, he has questions. What are your regrets? What suffering have you caused? Answer honestly. It's the only way you can escape. After that, the questions become specific, forensic. When the prisoner runs out of words, he quickly moves on and subjects another to his relentless interrogation. When he comes to the fifth prisoner, he steps back and nudges you. Your turn. Oh. Um... Ask the prisoner about the rules of Paranesi. <laughs> While you're in conversation, perhaps you can learn something useful. Mm. I think if I did that, I would not gain rapport. I don't think they would like that. Tell the prisoner there are other ways to change. A cautionary tale. <laughs> Refuse to speak. Hmm. I mean, I could also just try to persuade the prisoner to repent. 22% chance of success. Nah, yeah, screw it. Let's just ask the prisoner about the rules of Paranesi. The prisoner shrugs. She doesn't know or she's unwilling to tell you. 
Oh, I thought that would end it, but no. Um, a cautionary tale. Tell the prisoner a horrifying story of what happens to those who fail to correct their sins. As you reach a particularly grisly part of your story, color drains from the prisoner's face. I'll be good, she promises fervently. You can stop with the details. The reformer claps a hand on your shoulder and chuckles softly. Ah, too rapport. Oh, is that it? Like, I... Yeah, I think that's it. I mean, back to the flutist. Can't do anything there, of course. Just gotta leave. All right. The reformer pauses beside an unlit candelabra and pulls it like a lever. A section of wall rumbles aside, revealing a staircase. A shortcut, he explains. Soon enough, you've left the confines of Paranesi and the sky seems dizzyingly wide. The reformer returns to his cottage, patting you amicably on the shoulder as he leaves your side. Okay, so I can't do any more tours for now. Leave. Turn and leave. As you leave, you come across the glistening deformer in the cottage's herb garden. He's still wearing his hooded robes, but he's stuffed gardening gloves over the sleeves and is engaged in a furiously futile attempt to stamp his shovel into the stony soil. We're currently indisposed, he grunts, noticing you for the first time. We'll be open to visitors again in two weeks. As you turn to leave, he finally manages to embed his spade into the ground and levers up something tendrilled and twitching from the soil. Is it loading something? The game's not responding. I guess we made a lot of dialogue in there. There we go. Yeah, I was just being laggy. Oh, they don't... They don't have fuel or supplies, I have just realized. Let's leave so it stops being laggy. Yeah, I'm pretty low on fuel, actually. Hmm. Okay, well, I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return... I think I'm going to explore and head back to Pan at the same time, because the way to Pan is all unexplored.